Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Hope you guys are doing well. And I think it's about time that we spend a little bit of extra attention on a couple of players. A couple of players who a lot of people, myself included, thought were going to be part of the reason why we wouldn't be able to get a win in Detroit, but ended up being part of the reason why we did get a win in Detroit. But to just end the story with those two guys, I think would not be sufficient. So we're going to talk about these two guys, but we're also going to talk about another guy, and then we're going to talk about another another guy as well, who all kind of weaved together to make what we saw on Sunday possible. And I don't know if this is going to keep up going forward. I don't know if this is going to be a running thing throughout the rest of the season. I don't know if we're going to be able to count on this in every game we play, but for one week at least, it came together really, really well, and I don't think very many people thought this had any possibility of happening. And <clears throat> Stone Foresight especially, is because obviously I'm talking about our backup tackles that went in there and played respectably against the Detroit Lions. Stone Forsyth in particular is a guy most Seahawks fans have left for dead. They've left Stone Forsyth for dead because he's looked so bad. He looked really, really bad um, in the preseason. He looked bad last year. He just looks like he's not an NFL tackle. And most Seahawks fans, when they knew Stone Forsyth was going to be our starting left tackle for this game, just went, well, there's no way anything good is going to happen there. And I, I have the PFF page open. I don't think PFF really tells the full story here. I think PFF is only scratching the surface. They gave him good grades for this game. They did. 70.4, 62.1 run block grade, 75.2 uh, pass block grade. Um, those are good grades. They're only a little bit better than what he did last week in 12 snaps against the Rams, which, I mean, watching the two games, he just looked way better against Detroit. But the important part is there's no doubt he was way better than he was in the preseason and way better than he was last season. So Stone Forsythe steps up in a big way. He's not a liability in any one area. And the only thing on his ledger really is three quarterback pressures, not hits, not sacks, just pressures. Three pressures across 44 opportunities to allow a pressure. He had 49 pass block snaps and only allowed three QB pressures. And didn't get docked with any penalties. Didn't Wasn't an obvious liability in run, run blocking. It, it was really a full package game from Stone Forsythe. And as a guy who really liked him when we drafted him, I'm happy that we're getting something out of this because... I saw the potential at Florida. I saw the potential when we drafted him, and it, we haven't really seen it until now. And honestly, PFF might be being a little harsh with him. More on that in a second. But we also got to talk about Jay Curhan, a guy who played miserably last week. And by the way, PFF, I think, is just out of pocket here. So to, to uh, go over the particulars, last week against the Rams, Jay Curhan is on the field for 11 pass block snaps. 10 opportunities to allow a pressure, he allowed 4. And he gets a 65 grade. This week, he's on the field the whole game. 49 pass block snaps, 44 opportunities to allow a QB pressure. He allowed 4. And somehow his grade went down. I know it was mostly because his run blocking was slightly worse, but his pass block grade, like, like PFF, make it make sense. Like just surface level, how can this be the case? How can he improve his efficiency from 80% to 96% almost, and then the grade changes insignificantly? Like, not, not even meaningful change. So, I don't know. PFF, make it make sense. But to me, Jay Curhan also played really well on the right side. Obviously, he's more of a run blocker um, than a pass blocker, so he is going to let some stuff through. He's going to occasionally get beat, but... For a guy who I thought looked miserable against the Rams, just completely unplayable, I was really happy to see him look good against the Lions because, to me, I I, I felt like Curhan was a guy who had proven himself in previous games, proven himself in previous seasons, that he was an okay player. So the fact that Curhan played that bad against the Rams was making me think, did this guy just regress? I hope it was just a one-off. I hope it was because he came off the bench cold, and that looks like exactly that's what it was because he looked respectably good in this game. Now, PFF gives him four QB pressures allowed, and I want to stress again, zero hit, zero sacks, just four QB pressures. So that's seven combined for Forsyth and Kerhan. Now, 
that's PFF. And PFF is notoriously harsh when it comes to things like QB pressures. If you go over to this article that Corbin Smith wrote for uh, SI.com and you scroll down a little bit, he believes they allowed three combined pressures. So it might have been even better than that, like a lot better. It just depends on who you ask. Pressures are subjective. It's very possible for these two guys to watch the exact same game and come away with completely different impressions about exactly how the tackles played. So we've got this. Obviously, both guys played well, well enough for us to win, well enough for us to get it done. And I I think that just on the surface level, you're seeing something promising here where we now can sit here and go, we don't have to rush Charles Cross back. We do not have to rush Abe Lucas back. We can play well and win and have success without those guys for a little while. If we have to, there is a way. So get better soon, Cross, but you don't have to rush back now. So that's great. But I want to talk about another element here, of course, because as you can see, both these guys did allow some pressure. Whether or not you buy PFF's very aggressive pressure formula, however they do things... They did allow some stuff, but Geno Smith was sacked once in that game, and it was completely his fault. That one sack completely on Geno has nothing to do with the offensive line whatsoever. Zilch, nada. That was the only time in that game he got hit. You go over to Geno's PFF page and look at his some of, uh, some of his advanced numbers here. You can take a look. He was pressured in that game. A grand total of 15 times. That's the number right here. 15. He was not hit, but one time... He was not hit as thrown once. He had the one sack, which I already mentioned. And I looked through the PFF page for all of our other offensive linemen, tight ends, and running backs. There were no QB hits allowed. So Geno's getting pressured a decent amount. I mean, 15 QB pressures in one game, that's... Not nothing. It's it's something you can definitely work with. With all the dropbacks that he had in this game, that's a reasonable number, but it's not nothing. And yet, I don't believe he got hit except for the one time. I think he got hit once on the sack, which again, had nothing to do with the offensive line. So, you've got Shane Waldron. That's the other, other guy that I was talking about. Shane Waldron coming up with a game plan that allows these guys to be themselves, play above their heads, but not be not be elite. Because Stone Forsyth was not Walter Jones out there. Stone uh, Jake Curhan was not Lane Johnson out there. They were not Hall of Famers out there. They played good. They played respectably well, and I was really happy about that. But you've got Shane Waldron coming up with this game plan that allows for those guys to be in the game and the offense to still thrive. But... You take a look at this. This is the thing that really caught my attention. According to PFF, Geno Smith's average time to throw was 3.11 seconds. That's actually pretty long. I know it doesn't seem like it. 3.11 seconds is probably, in the modern NFL, an above average time of holding the ball. Not by much. But to give an idea, that is, I think, about a half second longer than Stafford had the ball in his hands against the Seahawks last week when he was doing a real good job getting the ball out. That extra half second means a lot. So this was not a three-step drop, get it out immediately game for Geno Smith. Geno Smith took his time. Geno Smith let plays develop. Not so much deep down the field. He wasn't hitting a bunch of deep shots. He wasn't taking a lot of 50-yard bomb shots to lock it in Metcalf. But he took his time. And yet, he got hit once. Again, completely his fault, not not on the offensive line. So you also have this element here of Geno Smith navigating the pocket when there is pressure, using his footwork to keep plays alive, not take a hit, not take a sack, complete a pass, or on a couple cases, scramble for positive yards. He had, according to PFF, three scrambles in this game for a grand total of 19 yards. I believe he had a 15-yard run, a 3-yard run, and a 1-yard run. Better than a sack. Better than a sack. Easily better than a sack. So you have all these things coming together. Geno Smith playing this brilliant, masterful game where he's able to allow the play to develop without allowing himself to get hurt, allowing himself to get hit, allowing himself to be put in danger. Again, 
he got hit once this whole game. I know he got pressured a few times, but he was able to navigate that pressure like a pro. You've got a game plan that allows these backup tackles to be in the game and still have success. You've got all these things going on with this offense, and then you've got the play of the tackles. So what we had on Sunday was a really beautiful unison of backup tackles playing above their heads, a quarterback customizing the way that he played around having those backup tackles so that they didn't tank the game, and an offensive coordinator who recognized what the challenge was going to be and how to address it. Like, did we take a deep shot that game? Did we take any deep shots that whole game, really? Not not much. Most of it was... We had some plays around the line of scrimmage. We had some plays in the intermediate area. We had some short stuff. There wasn't a lot of stuff where we were trying to push the ball super deep down the field. So there was an understanding of what was going on here, and this is what I'm talking about. In games like this, you prove how good of a coach are you. How good of a quarterback are you when not everything is going exactly the way you wanted? Going into this season, Geno Smith thought he was going to have pretty much everything working really well around him. The offensive line, the running backs, the tight ends, the wide receivers. That's not what we have right now. And he found a way to work through it. Because as good as Forsyth and Curhan did play, they allowed this to happen. They're still not Cross and Lucas. But watching this game, you could have been fooled into it because Geno barely got touched. And all these things had to come together to allow that to happen, is what I'm trying to get at here. And that was something beautiful. That makes you think that this Waldron guy has staying power in this league and could be a great offensive coordinator, maybe even head coach at some point. Makes you think that what Geno did last year is not a fluke and he's a really good quarterback. Makes you think that these tackles, these backup tackles, are capable of playing quality football, not just in this game, but in other games as well. So that's what I got. Let me know what you guys think. See you guys later. Go Hawks.